I start. Okay. Good morning, adventuresses. Good morning, uh, Heather. No, wait, stay. Stop, stop, stop. We have to say good evening today. <laughs> Well, it's, okay, after, it's afternoon again. now, so, okay. Good evening, adventurous. <laughs> okay. okay, let's start. Well, for me, it's okay. evening, so I say good evening. Okay, good evening, adventurous. Good evening, Heather. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast uh, for women who love horses, traveling, and adventures. Hi, Uta. Well, it's uh, mid after, well, I guess just after lunch for me today. So we're still on our eight hour time difference. So we're still uh, same day talking. It's not morning for me, night for you or opposite. We're in different time zones. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not quite as bad as usual. I'm still in Germany. So it's, uh, what is it? Eight hours time difference? So eight that's hours, not too bad. Yeah. So, so you're still on your holiday now. You're uh, enjoying having uh, mom make meals. You're not no housework for you. It's been a, a nice little break for you. Yeah, indeed it has been. But actually, I have to prolong it a little bit because I'm now starting my annual my my final exams for my diploma. So it's actually uh, it was supposed to be in July, but because of COVID nineteen, it has all been like you know this year has been totally crazy. So my university has kind of waited and waited and waited uh, because they actually wanted to have the proper center based exam, but now they've given up because uh, they said okay we have to you know we can't postpone uh, uh, forever. We have to eventually make our students write the exam. So now it's online exams, and they're going to start from next week. So. So I'll be a little bit longer in Germany because I couldn't, my flight, was, my flight would have clashed with my exam dates and that wouldn't have been a great idea. And I don't like to give exam straight after a long night flight. So I said, okay, perfect. I'll just, you know, hang, hang here a couple of days more. And um, yeah, so I'm still going to be here for the coming week. And then on fifth, finally, I had back to, to India and back to proper life. And as you said, like to proper responsibilities, because here I'm really like a daughter, which is nice, which has been a nice change for a little while. But yeah, because of my exam preparation and uh, well, the podcast, there's always a lot of work for me here too. Well, that's, well, it's always nice to, uh, to get away, but it is always nice to go home and get back into your regular routine. I know uh, around my place, uh, school is starting up next week, so my son is, um, you know, it's going to be torture for him not to sleep till noon, um, but have to get up and, and have some routine, uh, which, which I think lots of um, everybody is really craving. You know, we've had, uh, you know, the last really five months of, of life here in North America has really been turned upside down with, with the COVID situation. So getting some normalcy back in, uh, into our routines will be well looked forward to. Right. Yeah, perfect. So what's the topic we have on today? It's another question and answer. So we got a really, really interesting question from one of our uh, fellow adventuresses in the group. So, so what, what question we have today, Heather? Um, well, the question we received was about moving your horse uh, across borders, uh, you know, kind of basic costs. Um, so, so we did a, a real deep dive into some research to find out what we could find on all over the world with, um, you know, if you wanted to take your horse from the United States to Canada or traveling between France and Spain. Um, so it, it's been uh, really interesting to learn um, all of the requirements. Um, now we are going to give kind of a general overview for each place, just simply because the rules are, um, are constantly changing and the rules are slightly different now with the COVID um, border closures. Exactly. So you may, you know, the rule might be this um, now, but it could change, you know, if borders open or new borders close. Um, so I think I'm going to start with... Um, what do you do if you want to take your horse from the United States to Canada? Um, so, so there is no uh, quarantine requirements <clears throat> when you travel between Canada and the U.S. or U.S. and Canada, which, which is nice because um, the country is being so large. A lot of times it takes you, you know, quite a few days even just to get to the border. So, so that, that's kind of a nice thing. Um, probably the most important um, item that you're going to need 
is that health certificate from your from your local veterinarian that is licensed that says that you know your horse is free of um, multiple of diseases um, and it, it's really important to check um, with the uh, animal plant health inspection services because they are going to be the ones that are going to give you a real breakdown of you know what diseases they have to be free from. Some of these diseases I'd never even heard of before. So they really, you know, they put a blanket over for everything. Um, yes. There are some different rules depending on how long you plan to take the horse uh, into Canada or into the United States. Um, and if you're planning on selling the horse um, on either side. So, so those are things to, you know, kind of keep in mind. Um, they, Traveling from the U.S. to Canada, um, you're allowed 30 days to, to have the horse in and, and return without needing any additional uh, inspection. Um, but they do need to have been in the originating country for a minimum of 60 days before you move them into the new country. So, so that's kind of something to keep in mind that if you import a horse from uh, Mexico or the EU or the UK into the United States and then you want to bring them into Canada, they must have been in um, the United States for a minimum of 60 days prior. Um, and as well as they, they will need to be uh, found, you know, contagious, disease free, those sort of things. Um, something else that you will need to have is um, a bill of sale when you're traveling, you, you want to have proof of ownership of that animal when you're when you're crossing yes, the border. Very that, that's, it, it's really important because there is, um, you know, you there's theft, there's and and so many things that you, you want to have um, just proper documentation. Lots of horses are microchipped now, tattooed, uh, all of those things. You know, having having that. Um, um, documentation. Another thing that I found really interesting was um, that they can't have been vaccinated within 14 days um, preceding the trans crossing the border. So that was sure. something that sure. um, that was really interesting to find out. Um, you there sometimes are some small fees when you're crossing the border, um, you know, anywhere between 50 and $100 to have certain paperwork cleared um, between Canada and the US. So, so you know, that, that's fairly minimal. Um, other costs associated will be um, whatever your local veterinarian charges for those health certificates. You know, depending on if you take your horse to the clinic um, to have the test done or if the horse or if the veterinarian comes out to your property, because um, there'll be, you know, those fees can be anywhere from, you know, hundred to five hundred dollars depending on um, you know the what your veterinarian has as his own uh, fees for those kind of things so so that's something to uh, to to kind of keep in mind um, one other area that was really interesting is that um, because the Canadian and American border is so so large there are um, there's only specific uh, ports of entry that will allow you to to cross with the horse so that you know depending on where you're coming from i did see you know idaho um, there's some in maine uh, and then some of your bigger ones your detroit uh sault st marie michigan um north or pardon me portal in north dakota which is close by me uh, some in washington montana you know so those are things that you really want to take into consideration uh, you don't want to have to add a whole day's drive just because you have um, have have misjudged that your regular border crossing. Oh well, no, you have to go, you know, to the next state to uh, to cross. So so that's something that um, that you do want to to uh, take into consideration. Um, just to circle back with when you're selling an animal when you're crossing the border, um, if you're coming into Canada, you will have to pay um, tax. On, on the horse, so the PST or GST that is required. Yes. Um, and if you're having someone deliver the horse, you know, th those um, brokers will also have to pay that. Um, all horses crossing borders will require a Coggins test um, and it has to be valid within 30 days. So that, that's something to, uh, to, to check out. Um, Canadian Border Service Agency, 
they have a ton of information on their website, um, which we will include in the, uh, in the show notes for you um, for, for really good information. Um, I, I probably, you know, the theme of most of our shows is patience, be prepared. Um, whenever mm -hmm. you're crossing a border, uh, being prepared, having the documents, you know, planning well in advance um, yes. that I want to cross and knowing, you know, it, if you have, if you're getting close to that 30 or 60 days, you'll, you'll want to make sure that, you know, you have the proper documentation for, um, for when you're coming back home, um, just to make sure that they do allow you to come back home. <laughs> so, or to bring your animal back home. Um, now, traveling from the United States to Mexico or vice versa is a little bit different because their border is a little bit smaller. Um, and, and there's a few more restrictions. So the quarantine uh, three days on either side is required along with the health certificates, the Coggins test. Um, and and they, again, the 60 days being either in Mexico prior to coming into the US or 60 days in the US prior to going to um, into Mexico. Um, you know, health yeah. certificates, all of those things are really, um, really important. Um, make sure you have the right documents, um, you know, saying that your horse is free of all of the, the listed, um, you know, so, some of the ones Jesus. just, you know, African horse disease, uh, glanders, um, some of them I can't even pronounce, Venezuela equine <laughs> encephalitis, <laughs> contagious right. equine. infectious uh, equine <laughs> anemia and all stuff. Yes, yes. lots so, and lots of diseases. Lots and lots. So I I'm, I'm will in the show notes include the different websites that we did find the information on, Canadian Border Services, the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services. That's a really great site. You put in what country uh, to and from and it'll list, it'll give you, you know, what things the horse has to be free of, um, how long the quarantine is, um, and any special requirements that you do require. Now, uh, over to the other side of the world. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's plenty, plenty, plenty of horses traveling between the US and the European Union. I think it's probably one of the biggest uh, routes for horses going. Um, one of the biggest airlines actually transport, two big European airlines transporting a lot of horses is Lufthansa from Germany. Uh, they usually transport them from Frankfurt on to many, many different uh, places, many different um, airports in the US and in Canada as well. And then, of course, from uh, Amsterdam, from Schiphol Airport, um, that's the KLM. So KLM is very, very uh, well known. They have a huge um, equine center in Amsterdam where they prepare the horses for the shipping, where they can take care of, uh, you know, quarantine and stuff. Now, shipping horses is always a little bit more complicated than just transporting them on, on the ground, you know, so you need a lot of more paperwork, a lot of more transportation, it gets really complicated. So usually when people ship horses um, on air, when they, when they load them on flights, when <laughs> horses go up in the air, um, it's usually recommended that you um, get that organized through an agency. There's plenty of agencies organizing this horse travels pretty much in every country. They help you with all the paperwork. They let you know what you need. They let you know all the, they, they're the experts. Basically, they, they handle hundreds of horses every day, shipping them all through the world. So it's always a good idea to, you know, contact them, uh, see what they charge and uh, just, you know, organize it through them because otherwise it's really a lot of work. Um, right. So again, as said it, it it's so dependent on where to transport your horse into but usually if you go on air travel you need to have your horse quarantined you need to have of course a lot of blood tests a health certificate which should be uh, usually you should get that health certificate about 48 hours prior to the journey from the local vet uh, we will certify that the horse is free of disease, that the horse is good there. You should see that the horse is in a good condition because a lot of horses get stressed by travel. So the horse should be in as good as a condition as possible. Um, as I said, blood tests, vaccinations, you'll get to know what you need beforehand. You need the time to prepare uh, well for that. Um, 
so yes, so quarantine. So it depends a little bit whether you take a horse permanently or whether you just take it for a competition uh, on the, like how much of quarantine you have to take the horse for and where. So usually like for instance, if you take a horse from the US to Europe just for like a back, which doesn't need to quarantine before the journey, but it needs to quarantine on the way back. So while reaching the US again, after being out for, you know, a competition or something, it has to quarantine back there. Um, when you want to sell a horse in the European Union, you have to quarantine before sending it there. Same goes when you're selling a horse from the European Union. No, you don't need to quarantine it here. You quarantine it in the US mostly. There's a big, um, a big question usually, where do they transport horses on? And the interesting thing is actually a lot of these horses get transport on the normal passenger flights. So if you're traveling from, say, New York to uh, Schiphol, to Amsterdam or to, to Frankfurt, uh, Sometimes there's horses on board. So sometimes, you know, if you sit in one of these back rows and well, it was mostly the, you know, the, the seven, seven, four, sevens, two hundreds, and you would sit in one of the back rows. Sometimes you could see like groom coming out or going in because you always need to have a puff of, um, of uh, smell of the horse because they were directly behind the passengers. Now the big ones, uh, they are usually down in the belly. You will not see or smell them, but there's usually an excess somewhere because as I said, there's a groom traveling with them. So it's, it's always interesting. Um, sometimes you can ask or sometimes people kind of say, yeah, we have like Olympic horses going on this flight. So it's, it's interesting to know that they're traveling with us on the plane. Um, yeah. Um, Air transport for horses, as I said, it can be very stressful. Uh, if the horse is used to it, a lot of horses for them, it's not worse than being trucked for a couple of hours. So if the horse is used to traveling, many of them handle it quite well. The jet stalls or containers usually contain three horses. So um, it's usually cheaper, actually, if you bring three horses together or uh, rather than just a single horse. more expensive because as I said the three places they reach the destination in the US they get uh, usually to a to quarantine center and they take the blood test immediately and they have to quarantine for um, a certain amount of time <laughs> they have to quarantine I think for 48 hours first inside the US just give me one second here I have that I, I do know um, when you're bringing, bringing them in from South America, so for example, Brazil, um, horses uh, imported into the U.S. Um, from a skewworm-free region, um, transiting from a skewworm-affected region via air, land, or sea, they do require a seven-day quarantine in an animal import center. So, so it's not like you can even bring them home and just quarantine them. There, there's a specific place that they will actually be quarantined. So they are monitored and uh, vets are, are checking them quite regularly just to make sure that they're not bringing something into the United States or Canada or, or wherever it is. So that, 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 those are things that are really yeah, important. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, as I said, it always depends where you take them from. But from the European Union, usually you have to quarantine your geldings 24 hours on the U.S. soil and in USDA quarantine. So that's a special center where they take the blood and they check. Now for geldings, that's it. It's just 24 hours quarantine, then you can take them back home. But mares and stallions actually have to go to another quarantine center. It's a CEM quarantine. Um, and they, the CEM is a sexually transmitted disease in horses. So prior to flying, your horse need to be confirmed negative, but the U.S. takes the extra precaution to have this quarantine. So mares usually spend 15 days in the CEM quarantine, while stallions have to stay for 33. And during the CEM quarantine, mares are cultured and tested several times for this disease, but stallions are also cultured and tested. But in addition, any stallion you bring in has to require, uh, is, it's required to life cover two mares and those mares are also tested. So you can imagine the cost for a stallion is much higher. It's usually around 9,700 US dollar for a stallion, just this kind of sexually transmitted disease quarantine for 33 days and for mares it's $3,400. While a gelding, well you're lucky you don't need to quarantine and for this 
particular disease. So it's, it's kind of very interesting. The US is very particular about these things. Uh, yeah, so that is definitely a thing to consider. Now in Europe, we are lucky because we have the European Union. So things are fairly straightforward there because you can actually transport your horse. You can truck it pretty much without much of precaution. I mean, obviously you need to have uh, always your identification for the horse. Like we have a European animal passport, which remains with the horse throughout their, um, its life. So you have to prove ownership. You have to be able to prove ownership wherever you go. You know, you can always be stopped. So people will demand um, identification for your horse and they'll demand a proof of ownership. So if the horse you're transporting or if your horse goes on transport with another with an agent or with another person, you always have to make sure that that person can kind of prove that he's allowed to transport the horse. That's very, very important in the European Union. Because as I said, like, or as you also mentioned, theft of horses is a big deal. So um, it's always important to make sure that you kind of certify that this person is allowed to transport my horse to that place. Even if a friend of yours or even your relative transports your horse, you kind of have to establish that, you know, you as the owner has given, you know, the, um, that permission to have your horse transported. Um, for some countries, or usually if you transport over several borders, you should have a health certificate. Um, again, 48 hours before uh, max, 38 hours be, uh, 48 hours before you start transport. Um, a vet should just stamp that the horse is in a good condition, that uh, all the, you know, that it's not suffering from any disease. You don't need to have any blood tests in the European Union. That's not necessary, but um, you should be a general health, health certificate from the local vet. Um, so that the horse is fit for travel. That's also important if you send your horse overseas, there should be, um, there's a certificate for international transport, for fitness for international transport, which can be signed by your vet. That's always a good thing to have. Uh, one more thing is suitable vehicles for transportation is an absolute must. There is very strict rules in the European Union with what and vehicles you can transport horses. There's very big rules. Usually a horse transporter has to make sure that the horse has a break every six hours, that somebody checks on the horse, that there's always fresh water given to the horse every six hours, and that there's some sort of food like hay or something is available. So that's quite strict. Um, in Europe, we have now the big exception of the, Euro of the United Kingdom. There is a little difficult because the United Kingdom just left the European Union. So now that is a little of a difficult topic at the moment because there's a lot of things which remain unclear now because we don't know how things will work out from next year when once they leave properly at the moment they are not in the european union anymore but they still kind of follow the same rules and regulations so um, the uk is a little bit difficult so they again need this kind of identification a health certificate not older than 48 hours um, uh, you must prove that your horse comes from a holding that is free of glaris, equine, and cephalomyelitis, equine infectious anemia, rabies, and of course, anthrax. Um, you need an important, notific an important notification form which you have to fill out. And of course, as I said, again, you have to comply with national animal welfare legislation in terms of what kind of transport you use. Um, we have a little bit of a of a problem in the United in the in the European Union with horses from Romania and sometimes Bulgaria as well, which are two countries inside the European Union, but they usually have a very poor animal health. So um, there are usually stringent, more stringent rules if you want to take your horse into Romania, Bulgaria, or take it from there back again, because there's a lot of cases of particularly. Um, uh, of this uh, equine infectious anemia, which is a pretty bad disease. It, um, you need to notify the authorities if you find that your horse, your horse is suffering from it and usually a horse. So that's pretty, pretty serious. Mm -hmm. So I know from uh, the UK, for instance, they have very stringent rules. If your horse comes from there, you have to have answer a lot of questions and give a lot of extra additional blood tests. It's not yet so much from Germany, I think, but still you should check what are the, uh, the regulations at the moment because these things can change. As you already mentioned, COVID-19 has changed a lot of the, um, of the things also in the European Union. 
um, some of the borders were closed for a while, some of the, of the borders now, I think inside the Union, all borders are open again. But it might change with the disease, you know, coming back. I mean, Corona doesn't have anything to do with horses, but it will affect the way we can transport horses freely from one country to the next. So particularly at the moment, I would always advise check, check, check to make sure that the way you're taking the horse, that you have all necessary documentation and that you have everything that you need uh, to transport your horse from one country to the next and that all borders are open and that you can do all these things. So yeah, European Union is usually fairly straightforward, but you need to, as I said, the couple of points which I mentioned should you should have and a couple of documentation you should have, definitely. Good. So uh, turning back a little bit towards international travel, what, what more have you found? Uh, well, that it, it is not um, uh, cheap, that's for sure. If you want to uh, fly your pony from North America to, uh, to Europe, mm -hmm. um, really depending on uh, what level, coach or first class, um, <laughs> or how many you're taking, it can be anywhere from about $8,000 to, to $30,000, mm -hmm. uh, depending on um, where you're wanting to go, where you're starting from, um, and what level of, of service, essentially, that you're, you're wanting to buy. Domestically, it isn't too bad, um, between three and 5000 So if you were relocating, for example, from you know, Los Angeles to New York or you know, Vancouver to Halifax, um, you know, that's in the three to $5,000 range. Um, so flying with your, with your horses um, are not, um, uh, it is not a, a cheap venture. Um, so, you know, really, I think looking at, at your, um, you know, your local transport companies um, that do provide ground transfer will probably be uh, more cost effective. Um, for, for those kind of things, unless, you know, unless you have won the big Powerball or the, the, the super lotto, and then, and then we're all going to exactly. come with you and take our horses somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Then money doesn't make a difference. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I checked out some of the costs of 2019. Again, it's like one year old. Now Corona probably has changed a lot, particularly flying because there's simply mm -hmm. less planes going at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure prices have shot up like anything. But like 2019, the cost for um, for taking a stallion from uh, a, a horse, sorry, a horse from um, from Amsterdam to uh, Los Angeles was about 6,700 USD, and to to JFK to to um, to New York it was about 5,500 uh, US dollar. So at that time it was kind of reasonable as you said you can probably you have to check out the prices and the the outfitters uh, it depends a little bit how how i guess how flexible you are if you are flexible enough to wait a couple of weeks longer you might find something a little bit cheaper if you need to go on a specific date it might be more expensive but yeah i mean now with corona again i guess that the costs are much much higher because simply there is not such a big availability of flights so mm, difficult Yes. And, and unfortunately, um, unless you are, you know, the only way to, to transport your horse from North America to Europe is, is flying. Um, you know, I don't, uh, in all of the research that I did, I didn't see any, anywhere where um, they were shipping on boats or, or those kind of things. So um, Oddly, yeah. I, I think at the time it would just take you know, I think it's probably an eight or 10 day crossing, you know, just the Atlantic. I can't imagine how long it would be, you know, traveling from North America to Asia that way. So, so flying really, if, if that's something that you're wanting to do, um, that, that will have to be your, your only option. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. I think, um, ship traveling is almost, um, non-existent for horses. I guess if you know somebody, you know, who has a bit of space on their, small little boat <laughs> perhaps that works but yeah it's i found virtually no records of horses uh, mm -hmm. nowadays being tr being transported by ship even by rail is very rare i'm not sure is it north america perhaps but europe has no more option of shipping horses on railways it's all by, by road transportation or air transportation right. that's really it um, maybe one more word about, um, you know, to make like how, about how you should take your horse or how you should prepare your horse for air travel. Um, as I've already mentioned, it should be in a really good shape before you take it. Um, it should be up to date with all necessary vaccinations. 
as you said, make sure the vaccinations have been prior, uh, at least a month prior to to the to your journey, because. The problem is if you if you give a vaccination a shot to your horse, um, you can have side effects like some fever or some you know the horse might not be so well for a couple of days, and this kind of can as as you said it's like what you said it's two weeks prior to the to the import into the year to uh, days, the U S yeah. you can't fourteen days yeah right so you should actually you know to be on the safe side make it a month before. That you get and make sure the horse is really healthy it's in a good shape it's not stressed try to really give it a bit of a you know easy time before you take it that the horse is really you know happy and healthy and um yeah so that's that's always important before you you ship your horse or before you take your horse on a long track journey because it certainly stresses the horse mm -hmm. Um, well, I think, you know, this was a really great topic to, uh, to discuss. Um, we had, you know, it was great. We're, we're just loving how the questions are coming in off of the Facebook page um, through, you know, through the website, because um, it's, we really want to connect with our uh, followers, our listeners, um, and answer their questions that they have. And, you know, I learned quite a bit uh, myself from this. I, I was, I didn't realize that it was that expensive to travel, <laughs> to fly. Um, you know, my, my dreams of shipping over some beautiful Irish cob from Ireland, maybe I might need to get, uh, buy more lottery tickets. <laughs> But, well, um, I definitely you have to buy three horses because for three horses, it's cheaper than just, you know, a that's right. Point. Exactly. Um, so, you know, we do, we do, you know, the more questions that come in, we'll have, have more episodes like these where we'll go through your questions and, and answer them to the best of our ability. Now I know, you know, we were fairly general with, with our, our, our notes so far on this topic. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, 2020 has been a year of, of uncertainty. So it is, you know, rules are changing all the time. Right. Um, so if, if traveling internationally with your horse is something that you are interested in doing, you know, reach out to, um, you know, the, the different consulates, um, their uh, customs officers, they're going to be able to help you answer those questions and know what you're required yeah, to have specifically. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, what do you have going on for the rest of your day? Because the problem is really every country, in, which is here on my list, which I think we should quickly share with our listeners is about uh, the quarantine at home. Because if you bring a horse um, from another state or maybe another country, I mean, if you bring it by air and it has been quarantined anyway, it's probably safe to bring it to your barn. But particularly in Europe, if you kind of ship a horse from, say, France back to Germany, or if you buy a, if you find a beautiful horse on your, on your Spanish horse trail and you want to bring it back to Germany, a lot of people actually do that, in fact. Um, you don't need to quarantine it at all, but there's a few things you should think if you bring that new horse to your stable is that you should think about home quarantining it for at least 10 days in order to make sure it does not suffer from any disease. Because as I said, like you want to import a horse, you don't want to import any infectious diseases. There's plenty of them, particularly in Eastern Europe and some other countries. Uh, you might be just unlucky that the horse had some contact with an infected horse. So do one thing if you bring it and it hasn't been quarantined. Quarantine it for about 10 days in your own barn. Um, just to make sure uh, that uh, there is no, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with it. Exactly. So there's, yeah, there's a couple of, of things you should consider. If you quarantine a horse, um, you should have a separate stall or best even in a, in a separate building and a separate stable where he is not in contact uh, to other, with other horses. I know it's difficult because horses are group animals and it's never nice to keep them, you know, away from other horses. But just to make sure that it does not have any infectious disease because they can spread through nasal secretions, even through air sometimes. I mean, COVID-19 is the best example, right? They can have like whatever, you know, it's best to, to just use an entire separate building. Keep the horse there for at least 10 days. Uh, while a three weeks quarantine is usually recommended to truly quarantine a horse, uh, it's very impractical for to quarantine it for three weeks. So 10 days is the minimum period. So it's long enough for most diseases to develop symptoms. 
So use separate tools when you quarantine your horse for 10 days, because if you take like, you know, pitchforks, uh, water buckets, brushes, wheelbarrows, they carry easily the disease from one horse to the other, right? So keep all these tools separate, make sure they're clearly labeled, make sure nobody takes them to, you know, mug out other stalls and stables from other horses. Um, if you can store the food separately as well, you know, keep separate food there for the horse um, because again, it's easy to contaminate other feeds when you're bringing in a quarantine horse's bucket into the feed room, you know, so separate everything just for re a, a reduced risk of contamination. And as well, what it, if what you it can does... just have one person care for the quarantine horse. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, the one thing the quarantine also does is is it gets the new horse uh, used to its surroundings, and you know they're going to be calling to each other and everything because they're still going to probably in most cases still be able to see each other. They just won't be able to touch each other. Exactly. Uh, so, so those kind of things also help with that transition in, in introducing a new horse to of the course. to the herd. Yeah, exactly. If you can have just one person care for the quarantine horse, because if there's multiple people, then again, the risk of transmission is so much higher. So um, if you can't have like a separate person who's only going to that horse, but also having contact with other horses, just make sure hygiene, 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 right? Wash your hands, uh, change clothes. If you can shower just to be on the safe side, um, stay in contact with your vet. If the horse shows any illness contact your vet immediately because the sooner you contact the sooner you can begin treating horses illness or you know checking out is it something serious contagious or is it just something you know very normal and basic um, and if you're really taking a horse from like a high-risk country or from stable with you know known diseases uh, just consider using a quarantine facility because there people are really professional i mean obviously it's more expensive but it is the safest way to do it so yeah so that's about you know quarantining the horse if you buy a new one bringing it to your farm right yeah so what I, else did we did we miss any point um i don't think so we pretty well covered off all of, of what i found anyways about you know traveling you know north america is is you know a little bit simpler you know just um, as well as traveling within the EU, um, it's when you're when you go from North America to the EU or vice versa is where things get you know a little bit more complicated with more quarantines, um, and clearly the cost factor is, is so much higher when sure. you're when you're travel you know when when flying is involved versus the ground transportation exactly. Mm -hmm. Although I think the most it gets really really complicated if you're looking at um, other countries and I think between European Union U.S. or Canada it's fairly straightforward. I know the European Union, for instance, doesn't allow horses from countries with uh, cases of African horse sickness. That mm -hmm. is a big uh, no go for the European Union. For instance, from India, you're not allowed to take any horses uh, into the European Union. You can only, if you want to bring a horse from India to Germany, you can only do it via a third country like Russia or like uh, Turkey, where you keep the horse for um, a certain period of time, usually six months, uh, so that the horse kind of then comes from the third country going into the European Union, but you cannot take them straight. <laughs> Yeah, lots of rules, and I'm sure that as so that's as, where it very gets very very complicated. Mm -hmm. And and as as we manage to get through the rest of 2020, all of the rules could change. So you know, double checking, exactly. triple checking, those kind of things. Yeah, that's really difficult. I mean, there's a lot of people who did like this long distance riding covering several countries, also in Asia, for instance. So um, I've read a few of their, um, you know, of their uh, stories and of their reports and many actually managed to get the horses across borders. Some did not manage at all. Like I know from instance, uh, there was a, there was a guy, he was traveling through this, through basically the South uh, Asian uh, part, like India, Pakistan, and he tried to get a horse from India to Pakistan. And it took him like he was at the border for like three weeks stuck, always trying and trying and trying, and he didn't get the horse over. So by the end of the day, he had to sell his horse in India, uh, cross over into Pakistan and buy a new horse. There. Um, these kind of stories, you know, it's always more difficult because there's not such exact rules and regulations in countries such as Pakistan or Turkmenistan. or There's a lot of countries where it's more difficult to really establish 
is it possible? Is it not possible? So if you are planning on a long distance ride, again, as you said, try to find out as many things as you can. But then it can be always, you, you might be at the mercy of like a custom official at the border. So then you never know if you can actually get the cross across or not. So always, you know, have a contingency plan, have a plan B in case you cannot get your horse over or, you know, reroute. So border crossing can be, can be difficult at some times. And uh, yeah, so always important to try and try the best, try to be as well informed as you can. But then in some countries, you just never know how things will develop. Yes, patience, that, that probably has to be uh, your, your patience and be prepared. Because uh, anytime you're dealing exactly. with- Exactly, and persistency. Right, exactly. <laughs> Um, well, hopefully we will get more questions like this come in so we can have more of our question and uh, Q&A episodes. Um, I think that that's all that we'll have for today. Um, did you have anything else to add? No, that's pretty much it from my side. Again, as you said, I also want to, to, to really stress this fact. We're really happy to get these questions. We're happy to do the research for you. I mean, both Heather and me, we do have a lot of experience. We know a lot of people. Uh, we can ask uh, f about their personal experiences, but we're really happy to do um, the research for you to dig deep into, um, you know, legislatives and rules and regulations and find out some facts for you. Uh, doing a little bit of detective work so yeah do go ahead send us all your questions things you always wanted to know things even questions which might you might think hmm, that might sound a little stupid there's no stupid questions just ask them straight away we're happy to do uh, to devote like a whole episode for for a good question or maybe you know put together a couple of similar questions similar topics uh, so go ahead we're happy to do these q and a's these are just done for you and uh, always happy uh, if you come along and send us your questions and interact with us. And that's what we actually like to do, love doing, um, to have the special uh, relationship with, uh, with our audience. So yeah, perfect. That's all um, from my side so far. Great. All right. Well, then we will sign off and we will talk again soon. Have a great day. Have a great day and happy trails. Happy trails.